Today on LA Currents, she was born in LA and raised in the Crenshaw District. We sit down with LA County District Attorney, Jackie Lacey. Lights, camera, and outdoor movies. A classic family pastime is making a comeback in a major way. Finally, we take a look at LA City's Department of Aging and their work during the pandemic. Jackie Lacey has a 40-year career with some remarkable highlights, as well as being the first woman and first African-American to lead the nation's largest DA office. Lawyer, counselor, attorney, barrister, defender, solicitor, no matter how you say it, my guest today is actually responsible for the office that has one thousand of them, 1,000 lawyers to be exact. I'm delighted to be joined today by LA County District Attorney Jackie Lacey. So nice to have you here. It's nice to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to your viewers about what's going on in the DA's office. So this DA's office is truly the largest in the country. So given that scope and scale, I mean, what are the fundamental responsibilities of the LA County District Attorney? Well, we're a constitutional office, and our job is to prosecute cases that come before us. And people get a little confused because there are actually nine city attorneys in addition to the DA's office, and those city attorneys do the misdemeanors uh, in those areas. And we do all of the felonies throughout LA County, uh, and uh, we do the misdemeanors in the unincorporated area. So we're responsible for a tremendous amount of cases. We, we probably look at 120,000 uh, police reports and review them for filing cases in one year's time. In your world, I would imagine there have been a huge you know, domino effect of things that have had to change and had to be adjusted within the district attorney's office for the pandemic. What are some of the challenges you faced in order to be able to adjust to this? You know, the biggest challenges were courtroom people. Right, We do a lot of our, our, our work in the courtroom. And the biggest challenge is figuring out um, how to safely advocate in court. Uh, and that's been the biggest challenge. So we have a number of our employees that are, our lawyers are able to appear virtually via video. Oh, really? But it really isn't the same all the time. You know, a lot of times we need the lawyer actually in court advocating or talking. One challenge I'm kind of excited about meeting next week, for instance, is we're gonna bring jurors in for a really? jury trial. Yeah, next week. Virtually or live? Uh, well, it'll be partially virtual, but there may be a time where jurors are actually in the courtroom and we'll litigate it as it goes along. So remember, if you've ever done jury service, they bring a big, huge group of people in, right? And um, you can't do that with social distancing. So they'll probably be appearing a shorter, a smaller group of people, probably virtually via Zoom or something like that. But it'll be exciting to see how it goes because as you know, um, get, just getting jurors to pay attention on Zoom might be difficult. Uh, what about a defendant? Doesn't he have the he or she have the right to have the jurors in the courtroom? And and, and also think about judging a witness's credibility uh, virtually. That may be very different from actually seeing them. We'll be venturing into areas that we've never ventured in before. Well, that's big picture stuff. So I'd love to hear some things. You know, you've had um, a lot of specific priorities. You know, in your tenures, uh, your two terms. You know your effort to protect seniors, you know, your effort to stop and um, help those who've been trafficked, human trafficked, the unhoused and the mentally ill. How do you feel all of those things that have been projects, initiatives and priorities for you, how do you feel they are right now? Where are they in their standing? I, I think we've made substantial improvements on a number of fronts. For instance, with seniors, um, you know, I got involved in that project because of my mother was scammed uh, by a phone con artist who said, uh, we have your grandson in jail, don't tell anybody, but just wire cash to this particular place. And what did they pick the wrong woman? They picked the wrong family, <laughs> I must tell you, because we all got involved in stopping it. But it got me to thinking that there are a lot of seniors who are falling victims to that. So we have been on a very deliberate, robust campaign to let seniors know via videos and, and pamphlets uh, that, hey, look, uh, be aware of this, that if somebody asks for any personal information, uh, be wary and, and hang up. So we've done that. With human trafficking, I'm most proud of the fact that 
We stopped really going after the women and the girls who were on the street because, because we started to ask the question, who's making that money? And really we've gone after traffickers in a very uh, robust and, and I think the right, you know, in my opinion, the right way. Uh, some of those traffickers are getting life in prison who are trafficking girls and, and women, and as, as they should, because this is uh, a terrible thing to enslave someone and force them to uh, use their bodies in order for you, for you to benefit. But mental health. Now, um, we're in the process, it's been five years since I published the Blueprint for Change, and we're in the process now looking to see where are those differences? And one report that I, I think would be interesting uh, for our viewers to note is in Los Angeles City. The police department, uh, LAPD, noted that there was a 43% decrease in the use of force against those who have a mental health crisis. That's huge. Uh, that should be on billboards. And much of it has been because we've invested in uh, mental health treatment more, but and we've trained officers in de-escalation. We run our own uh, training academy where we train officers, but I'd love to see those numbers go down further. And that's the work I really want to do, is see if we can uh, further improve this area and get people help, because a lot of the people are being warehoused in the jail and uh, they can, I, I'm, I'm certain that even based on the reports that I've seen, that if we had the right mental health services in place, we just would not need to have these people in jail. And jail really should be reserved for those uh, who are a danger to our society. Uh, you did say that you have the de-escalation training, but you also have a training within your department, which I thought was interesting, especially given the current uh, social unrest and the current issues of racism that need to be addressed you know, universally. You have bias training. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I am the first African American to hold this position, the first woman. I openly talked about race with my family growing up. My parents were from the South, uh, the Jim Crow South, and they openly talked to me about these issues. Uh, it wasn't until I got to be an adult that I realized that not everyone openly talks about race. As a matter of fact, in some households, it's taboo. But in the LA County DA's office, where we're serving a community which is uh, mostly people of color, we have got to discuss it. We've got to make sure that there aren't policies that discriminate. And uh, more importantly, let the public know that we're about uh, seeking justice uh, without regard to people's race or uh, gender or sexual orientation. So uh, I, I was one of the first department heads, I may have been the first to mandate it for everyone in my department. I'm very proud of the fact that our management team embraced it and our folks embraced it. And uh, I think we're a better office because of it. Do you feel the weight of being not just the first woman LADA, but also the first woman of color? I never imagined that I would be a prosecutor, really didn't know what prosecutors did. And I certainly never imagined that I would lead the largest office in the nation. You get a lot of feedback, particularly from girls of color. And you can see it. They're looking at you and you're thinking, okay, you have given me hope. And, and, and there's a responsibility with that. You want to not just be the first uh, person of your race or your, uh, the first woman. You want to be the best, right? And so you want to make sure that you do things for the right reasons, that you never embarrass the office, that you achieve, that you accomplish things, because you know that there are people who are inspired by watching you, and they may be inspired to also seek to be the first in their field. So it's, a, it's an extra weight, but uh, I, I'm glad to have it. I'm glad to be the one. If someone wanted to get information about what is happening. So go to our website. You can just Google now Los Angeles County District Attorney. Go to our website, check in regularly, but also sign up for our week, our monthly newsletter. I said weekly, monthly newsletter. Uh, and you'll get the information delivered to your e email box. But there's plenty of information. Look under reports uh, in our office. and You'll be able to see a lot of the great things we do. And look under our press releases. We put out more press releases uh, now than we ever have. And so there's a lot of reports. There's also something called a biannual report. 
read those so you'll get a chance to really know your DA's office. Excellent. Well, it's been delightful talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Popcorn, food trucks, and your favorite movies under the stars. Let's go to the drive-in. Right now is this moment for drive-ins. Whenever someone says something is dead or it's never coming back or that's the end of it, I think I'm gonna take that with a grain of salt because no one can predict the future. We normally show uh, in theaters, uh, mostly the Vista in Los Feliz. We also do the movie palaces downtown. And we have a 99-seat theater in the Arts District where we show avant-garde movies and we show more movies and have speakers. Because of COVID, of course, we can't do any of that. But we thought, we got to get back into screening, but we have to do it in a, a safe and a good way. Uh, Andrew. Yes. Great. And you're here for the double feature. I am. Okay. Drive-ins opened about a month and a half ago. We partnered with Electric Dusk Drive-In. They had all the equipment and experience. We had been doing programming, so we partnered up to put on what we're calling parking lot cinema. So it's 88.3 FM. Whenever you're out of the car, masks on, six feet apart. We're showing double features that we try to theme. Tonight is uh, Dazed and Confused, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I think we just did some Google searching about drive-ins in the area, and this one came up. We were just looking for something to do outside of the house, because we, you know, it's been quarantined forever. I, I love I love going to see movies, and this this seems like the the best way to do it right now. It gives them an opportunity for us to go to a movies without having to be inside a movie theater, and we're still all safe. So we're able to, I hope, I mean, knock wood do what's right and responsible, and at the same time, give people a night out. And then for uh, young people, what we're noticing is they've been in their house or they've been just talking to their friends on the computer, and this gives them a chance to come see a movie, you know, have a soda, have some popcorn, they stay in the car, but they can get out and actually have about as close to a regular date night or friend night as we're gonna have. It's my first time. Uh, no, never. Yeah, so we never went to drive in. This is my first time. I'm excited to see what it feels like and experience the real thing. <laughs> we're smiling. <laughs> I think we're ready. One, two, three, hundred, one, four, three, hundred. Now we have one additional thing. This can be an additional way to see movies and maybe a whole generation of people who didn't realize Oh, this is great. And maybe some swap meets turn back into drive-ins. I don't think we're going back to where suddenly there are a thousand drive-ins all over the country, but I do think you're going to see more. And I hope it lasts. We are at the Sony Pictures drive-in experience. We all love movies so much. We make them here and we love going to see them in movie theaters all around the country and we haven't been able to do that for the past five months. And it's so nice to be able to put up these amazing LCD screens and come together as a community to see movies again. Because it's on an LED screen, it's like state of the art, looks very high definition. The screens are two 30-foot LCD screens that are bright enough to show movies during the day. The quality is awesome. And the sound comes through your car radio on your FM radio.
We're here to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm very excited being here. Very fitting to be on a Hollywood studio to see a movie about movie making and Hollywood. Oh, I think it's awesome. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a filmmaker myself. I'm a huge movie fan. And to be on a, a lot with such a legacy is really cool. I've never been to a drive-in. I think it's a lot of fun. I've always loved drive-ins since I was a kid. I wish I could go back to the 60s. It's super magical once the lights come on and you roll down your windows and the breeze. It's a really fun family evening. Our opening weekend film, one of them was Karate Kid. And as you, if you remember that movie, at the end is a big fight scene. At the culmination of the fight scene, the entire audience erupted in cheers. And it just brought tears to my eyes of like that community feel, that family vibe, and just having fun as a group again in a safe, safe way. We're being incredibly COVID safe. We have a limited number of cars. Um, people have to remain in their cars for the entire time. They may use the restrooms, but you have to leave, have, wear a mask. It feels very safe. They were very organized. They were very uh, precise about precautions and everything. I wish we could kind of open the trunks and sit in the trunks or sit on the hoods of the car. I'm very happy that we could come and uh, see movies again to, in this day and age because of the virus. And I think this is a very um, great way of uh, going to see movies together from cars now. It's awesome. Wear the mask, keep apart, and come out. Right now we're set to end the Monday after Labor Day, but we are trying to figure out if we can extend. We would love for everyone to come and experience the Sony Pictures drive-in on the historic Sony Pictures lot. Day three of our Thai drive-in movie series. We're showing uh, Thai movies in our parking lot, paired with chef-curated snacks and food. We wanted to have an activity for people to still be able to enjoy going outside and still think of Thailand because we're the National Tourism Board and people obviously aren't traveling to Thailand right now. And the response has actually been really great, especially being at foreign films. You know, the concept is like, you know, would someone want to come out and watch a Thai movie? I love this restaurant. Ayara is one of my favorite Thai places here in Los Angeles. And I think uh, kind of like dinner in a movie is a great idea. And saying we want this to be a fun but really safe activity for everyone. Everyone remains in their cars and they pull in check in, get their snack kit, and get to their um, spot on the parking lot. Once they're on their lot, they will get uh, served their food, and they are given a phone number to text and add on any food throughout the movie. And we have runners to run it to their, their cars. It's great that they're doing it all in the car, and it's completely social distanced, and it's a great way to kind of get people together. So this is great. They're doing a really good job. I think the community, Los Angelinos, are craving experiences that we used to have, but just adjusted for the new norm. Well, I think this is the new reality that we're living in, right? I mean, uh, given the current restrictions, I think it's an excellent idea. It's a way to bring people in a safe environment. They, they feel comfortable, they don't have to, you know, be in close contact, I guess. Uh, I believe that people feel safe enough to come out and, and enjoy themselves. I feel like um, drive-in is kind of like the safest thing that you could do, being contained in your own car, everyone's wearing face masks, and it's a great way to support a local business. We're also here to support the Thai elephants in Thailand because they've been obviously hit very hard by tourism and the lack of tourism in Thailand, and so this is going to aid them. We're, um, Proceeds from the uh, ticket sales will go to the Thai Elephant Association. Los Angeles has the biggest community of Thais outside of Thailand. And uh, we love to bring something that brings the community together, but also something that will showcase more of our culture within Los Angeles. We really just want to have a great time. It's, it's, it's really nice to be able to see people come out, even during this time. And there's a sense of excitement. I think like everyone is just really eager to experience something new.
The pandemic has affected everyone's way of life. For our senior communities, they have become the most vulnerable. Hot, fresh meal for everyone, made this morning. Like a hot meal? Here you go, have a wonderful day, okay? I'm delighted to be joined by the Assistant General Manager of the Los Angeles Department on Aging, James Don. Nice to have you with us. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Well, as I said, seniors are in fact known as being at the epicenter of risk due to the fact that COVID seems to attack seniors at an unusually high rate. But there are ways to help seniors in this particular era, in particular with the Department of Aging. So how has the department had to adjust to the pandemic and being able to provide opportunities and services to seniors? Actually, um, in terms of the things that we've been doing to adjust to the situation, the top priority for us was ensuring that seniors continue to get fed. So now all of our meals basically are delivered. And we also switched from providing uh, meals five times per week to seven times. Mm -hmm. Let, let's get some practical numbers out here. So, you know, in a normal given day prior to this crisis, how many deliveries of meals did you offer? And also then how many in addition to that do you think actually came into senior citizens around the senior centers around Los Angeles? Well, prior to the pandemic, we were serving a combination of both home delivered and our, at our dining centers, uh, a little bit over 5,000 meals per day. Right now, that program uh, is serving over 6,000 per day. And then our additional Great Plates program, uh, another 11,600 about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so over 17,000 seniors are getting fed each day. What are the parameters that you're waiting for, your agency is waiting for, to be able to open those senior centers back up? I mean, can it be kind of like schools maybe one hour a day and let's do everything outside <laughs> you know are there you know things kind of slowly go going into place so they can open again we're, we're looking at that very carefully uh, just because of the vulnerability of the population that we serve mm -hmm. so i think ours would be a little bit more cautious uh, we're definitely looking uh, at how the cdc and the county health department uh, are going to issue their guidance in terms of senior centers. All of our senior centers are closed to the public. However, um, they're still actually providing services. So all of our case management staff at our service providers started doing telephone reassurance calls. Oh. Basically checking up on the seniors, making sure that they're okay. Um, many of them expressed uh, you know, that they were grateful uh, that somebody was looking in on them. Well, then that leads me to my next question. Um, what are some of the attributes of the Department of Aging? Obviously, you know, we've discussed meals, we've talked about senior centers, but that's just, you know, a fraction of what the Department of Agency actually touches when it comes to the life of the seniors in Los Angeles. So what are some of the other things that the department does? We've had a uh, job training program for seniors. And actually, it, it's, Older adult workers are actually extremely good workers. And even now, with the current economic climate, uh, some of them have still been able to find uh, jobs. Recently, because of the homelessness issue, we started noticing a number of seniors uh, who were, if they were still working, uh, because of the situation that they were in, if their health uh, would take a downturn, it would jeopardize their employment, which oh. in turn would jeopardize their housing. So um, under our, our uh, job training uh, director, Mariella, um, she proposed that we create a separate program specifically targeting homeless seniors or seniors who are at risk in order to provide them with job training opportunity and resources to search for jobs. Um, and we were given a small pilot program, enough to fund about 30 seniors, but for those 30 seniors, it really made a made lot of difference. difference. One of the other services that we provide, actually, is assistive transportation. That was something I was going to ask you about, because uh, 
you know, that is a critical component to anything, whether it getting food or supplies or medical or doctor's appointments or just anything. So mm -hmm. transportation. Yes, so we've operated a assistive transportation program for over 20 years and we're following all the protocols of making sure the vans are clean uh, before the start of the day as well as in between the, the rides uh, of the clients. We're also limiting uh, the passengers basically to just one. One of the, the programs that we've had in our service centers for the past 10-15 years has been a wellness program. Mm. And this is different from your normal uh, activities that you picture at a senior center like bingo or, or whatever. Um, these programs, our evidence-based programs are based on research from universities where they've basically stated, okay, if you follow this process, you will be guaranteed a actual result. Mm. Something that could be medically measured as improving the health of the seniors. Um, for me, since I really deal more with the budget issues of the program, it was a game changer because uh, in the past when I would lobby for funding for great senior programs, it's you have to have proof that it works. Right. Before it was, yeah, this is the right thing for to do for seniors. And then there were all these discussions over the years about what's the return on investment, yeah. you know? And suddenly I was able to say, hey, all these programs actually help seniors and is measurable. Uh, so we, we have programs that deal with uh, managing chronic diseases, uh, improving the health of sedentary seniors. Um, and that was actually one of our first wellness programs that we implemented and it had such wonderful results. Um, we had one senior who uh, prior to the program the best she could do was get to the door uh, and that was about it. Mm. By the time, and her, and her goal in the program was to be able to get to the front yard where the mailbox is to get her mail each day. Oh. Um, by the time she was done, she was so happy. She was walking around the neighborhood and she was demanding, okay, I finished your course, what's <laughs> next? You know, what are you gonna do for me now? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was a, a great story that was very motivational for us to establish a lot of our other programs. Are you looking for volunteers? A lot of the, the s staff at our senior centers, um, they use a lot of volunteers. And many of them are retirees or older mm -hmm. adults. And it was a really big challenge um, for them because a lot of those same uh, volunteers had to stay at home as well. Uh, so they had to scramble to find uh, replacement volunteers. Um, and that's where I, I have often thanked publicly um, my fellow city employees. Uh, the city has a disaster service worker uh, program and basically uh, any uh, city employee who's not in a critical role to maintain city operations are available for other departments who need the assistance. Uh, and we basically put in the request for additional uh, delivery drivers uh, as well as people to handle our phone bank when we're enrolling all those thousands of seniors in, in the Great Plates program. Um, and that really made a, a big difference. It still sounds to me like there's not enough people. <laughs> are, you st are you looking for people that could help sure. in some way, capacity? We're always looking always for looking. people. Um, Yes, if anybody's interested, um, they could either contact their, their local senior centers or call our department. They could just dial 311 and they'll get to our department and we could refer them to the agency that serves their neighborhood. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for all of you. And we have to reestablish what the actual line is to be a senior, I think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I often get asked, so what age is it when you're, uh, you're a senior? And, and I always respond, it depends on which federal program you ask. <laughs> there you go. Well, it was lovely to talk with you, James, and I wish you all the best. Thank right. you very much.